Hey there, folks. Are you dreaming of the open road, the wind in your hair, and the rumble of a Harley Davidson beneath you? Well, your dream is about to come true. Introducing John Elway Harley Davidson Dealership, your one stop destination for legendary Harley Davidson motorcycles right here in Greeley, Colorado. And here's the best part for a limited time, we're offering free delivery on all new motorcycle purchases. That's right, free delivery to your doorstep. No more long drives to the city and no more hassle. Your dream ride is just a call away and we'll bring it right to you. So don't miss out. Visit John Elway Harley. Harley Davidson in Greeley, Colorado today, where quality meets convenience. Discover the thrill of the open road. Call us at 970-351-8150 now or visit our website at johnelwayhd.com. That's 970-351-8150 or johnelwayhd.com. John Elway Harley Davidson, your Harley Davidson dealer with free delivery. Terms and conditions apply. Free delivery to limited areas. Call or visit our website for details. Offer ends soon, so hurry in. Don't wait any longer. Get your Harley Davidson delivered today. We can stop HIV, Iowa. A person living with and being treated for HIV can take one pill a day to protect their own health and prevent HIV from passing to sexual partners. We call it U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmittable. Visit StopHIVIowa.org. This is Space Time Series 22, Episode 44, for broadcast on the 14th of June, 2019. Coming up on Space Time, new questions about the origin of Earth's water, Changes in Jupiter's magnetic field and China's new family of long march launch vehicles. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. There's a new chapter in the ongoing search for the origins of Earth's water. Planet Earth was formed some 4.6 billion years ago in conditions which were far too hot for it to retain volatile substances such as water. Then there was the giant impact which resulted in the formation of Earth's moon when a Mars-sized planet called Thea, about a third the size of the Earth, slammed into the early proto-Earth 4.5 billion years ago turning both bodies into a magma ocean which would have boiled off any remaining volatiles, including water. For many years, scientists believe Earth got its water later from comets, which after all are often referred to as giant dirty snowballs because of their icy composition. As a comet approaches the sun, its ices begin to sublime, evaporating directly from a frozen ice into a gas, forming an atmosphere of water vapour in its coma and tail. When scientists began analysing the coma and tails of comets, they discovered the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in the water found in comets to be different from that of the water found in Earth's oceans. Water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is composed of a single proton nucleus orbited by an electron. However, there are two isotopes of hydrogen, one of which, called deuterium, involves the proton nucleus also containing a neutron. The deuterium to hydrogen ratio found in comets measured so far has generally been twice to three times that of ocean water on Earth, which implies that comets could only have delivered around 10% of Earth's water. Astronomers later discovered that a specific type of asteroid called a carbonaceous asteroid contained water with the right deuterium to hydrogen ratio. And so it was generally assumed that rather than comets, it was asteroids which supplied Earth with its water. However, now a new study reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics has reinvigorated the comet hypothesis after measuring the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in ices from the comet 46p Vitanin. When Vitanin approached the Earth back in December 2018, it was analysed by astronomers aboard a specially equipped Boeing 747 airliner. Called SOFIA, the Strategic Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, the aircraft is specially fitted with a large infrared telescope. Sophia found that 46p Vitanin has the same deuterium to hydrogen ratio as Earth's water. Only two other comets have similar ratios, and both belong to the same category of hyperactive comets as 46p Vitanin. Hyperactive comets are of special interest, because as they approach the Sun, they release more water than the surface area of their nucleus should allow. This excess water is produced by ice-rich particles present in their atmosphere. Now, astronomers have concluded that the more a comet tends towards hyperactivity, the more its deuterium-to-hydrogen ratio decreases and approaches that of Earth's water. 
In fact, scientists now think that a comet's deuterium to hydrogen ratio is most likely related to how much water is released from ice particles in the comet's coma compared to the amount released from the comet's snowy surface. In fact, the findings suggest that all comets could have a deuterium to hydrogen ratio similar to Earth's oceans after all, meaning they could well have delivered a large fraction of Earth's water. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists have discovered that Jupiter's magnetic field changes over time. The discovery, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, represents the first time the phenomenon known as secular variation has been detected on a planet other than Earth. Observations by NASA's Juno spacecraft has determined that the gas giant's secular variation is most likely being driven by the planet's deep atmospheric winds. The discovery will help scientists further understand Jupiter's interior structure, including its atmospheric dynamics. Juno's principal investigator, Scott Bolton from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, says the discovery was only possible because of Juno's extremely accurate scientific instruments and its unique orbit, which carries it low over the planet as it travels from pole to pole. Characterizing the magnetic field of a planet requires close-up measurements. Juno scientists compared data from NASA's past missions to Jupiter, including both the Pioneer 10 and 11 missions, as well as both the Voyager 1 and Ulysses spacecraft. They then compared these data to a new model of Jupiter's magnetic field, based on observations collected by Juno's first eight passes over Jupiter, using its magnetometer to develop a detailed three-dimensional map of the planet's magnetic field. Scientists found small but distinct changes in Jupiter's magnetic field between the first Pioneer data and that collected by Juno. The study suggests the secular variation is best explained by Jupiter's atmospheric or zonal winds. These winds extend more than 3,000 kilometers down from the planet's cloud tops. At that depth, the planet's interior begins to change from a gas to a highly conductive liquid metal. It's thought the winds are actually shearing the magnetic fields, stretching them and then carrying them around the planet. The secular variation was greatest at the planet's great blue spot, an intense patch of magnetic field near Jupiter's equator, where it intersects with strong zonal winds. Astronomers say these new findings on Jupiter could also help them better understand changes which are now unfolding in Earth's magnetic field. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. China is working on a new generation of launch vehicles. These include a new 53-metre-tall medium-lift rocket, the Long March 7, which first flew in 2016. Designed to replace the existing Long March 2F, the Long March 7 and its variants are expected to ultimately become the new workhorses of China's space fleet, eventually expected to account for around 70% of all Chinese launches. It's designed to be a two- or three-stage rocket with an optional satellite kick motor available for final payload positioning if needed. This will enable it to place 13.5 tonnes into low Earth orbit and and 5.5 tonnes into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. Then there's the new Long March 5, which we covered earlier this year. It's the first Chinese heavy lift vehicle designed from the ground up to focus on using liquid propellants. It could eventually replace the Long March 3B, currently the most powerful member of the Long March rocket family, and mainly used to place telecommunication satellites into geosynchronous orbits. While the Long March 5's maiden flight in 2016 went smoothly, a follow-up test flight in 2017 crashed and burned after a first-stage rocket motor failed. The 58-metre-tall launcher will use two to three stages, carrying 25 tonnes into low-Earth orbit, 14 tonnes into geostationary transfer orbit, and over 8 tonnes onto translunar orbits. It's expected to become operational later this year, and will provide the muscle needed to lift modules of China's new space station into orbit from 2021. But the Long March 5 won't be the only heavy-lift muscle in the Chinese fleet. The communist nation's also working on a new super heavy lift booster, the Long March 9, which will be key to Beijing's long-term plans to undertake mining operations on the moon. Once operational, the massive 110-metre-tall three-stage rocket will be capable of lifting between 50 and 140 tonnes into low Earth orbit. At the other end of the scale is the new 21-metre Long March 11, a small four-stage solid-fueled rocket designed to carry small payloads into sun-synchronous low Earth orbits. In fact, just last week, a Long March 11 was used to undertake China's first sea-based orbital rocket launch. 
The rocket was flown from what appears to have been a modified barge in the Yellow Sea off the coast of Shandong. The test flight is significant because it gives Beijing the ability to deploy satellites from mobile platforms. Of course, launching satellites from ship isn't new. The Russian-backed sea launch company used the converted floating oil platform to launch dozens of surplus Zenit rockets between 1999 and 2014. These rockets had their normal thermonuclear warheads replaced with commercial satellite payloads. Last week's Long March 11 sea launch carried the Bufeng 1A and 1B experimental satellites, which Beijing says are designed to monitor ocean winds and help improve weather forecasts. Also aboard were an Earth Imaging CubeSat, a remote sensing satellite, and three telecommunications satellites. Meanwhile, China is also continuing with its program to launch additional Badu navigation satellites as fast as possible. The project involves Beijing developing its own satellite navigation system, independent of the American GPS, Russian GLONASS or European Galileo systems. The Badu 2 Geo 8 is the latest to join the Chinese constellation, launched aboard a Long March 3C from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. It's the fourth Badu 2 backup satellite to be flown into orbit, and the 45th overall launch in the Badu constellation, which includes satellites in both geostationary and low and medium Earth orbits. And time now to check out the night skies for June on Skywatch. June, the fourth month of the old Roman calendar, is named after Julius Caesar. It's a great time to look up at the night skies and marvel at the sheer majesty of the Milky Way as it puts on a spectacular overhead display. June also marks the summer solstice north of the equator and the winter solstice in the southern hemisphere. This year, the solstice will occur at 1.54 Australian Eastern Standard Time on the morning of Saturday, June the 22nd. That's 3.54 in the afternoon, Friday, June the 21st, Greenwich Mean Time, and 11.54 in the morning, U.S. Eastern Daylight Time. The June solstice occurs when the sun reaches its most northerly point in the sky as seen from Earth, zenith appearing to be directly over the Tropic of Cancer. The seasons are governed by the tilt of Earth's axis as it journeys around the sun in a year. Regardless of Earth's position in its orbit around the sun, the axis always points to the same part of space. So on the day of the June solstice, Earth's south pole is tilted by 23.5 degrees away from the sun. The sun rises north of east and will set north of west. And six months later, when the south pole is tilted towards the sun, it'll be the southern hemisphere's summer and our listeners north of the equator will be rugging up for winter. Temperatures on Earth aren't determined by Earth's orbital distance from the sun, but rather the angle of the sun's rays striking on the planet's surface. In summer, the sun's high in the sky and the rays hit at a very steep angle, while in winter the sun is lower in the sky and the rays strike at a more shallow angle. In most parts of the world, the seasons begin on the day of the solstices or equinoxes. Almost overhead this time of the year, we have the constellation Virgo. Virgo is named after the goddess of justice and the harvest in ancient Greek mythology, who used her scales to weigh good and evil. However, she became so disenchanted with the evil deeds of men that she threw away her scales and retreated to the heavens. Interestingly, the ancient Egyptians also associated Virgo with agriculture. There, she was the goddess Isis who sprinkled heads of wheat across the skies, forming the Milky Way. To science, Virgo is a tightly packed region containing some 2,000 galaxies. These galaxies are all gravitationally bound into a giant galaxy cluster located some 60 million light years away. Our local group of galaxies, dominated by the Milky Way and Andromeda, are simply outlying members of this cluster. The Virgo cluster is the heart of the Virgo supercluster, which is one of the largest known structures in the universe, a massive galactic node in the large-scale cosmic web-like structure of the universe. In fact, the mass of the Virgo supercluster is so great, its gravity generates what's called the Virgo-centric flow. This flow is causing our Milky Way galaxy, as well as Andromeda and the other members of the local galactic group, to move towards the supercluster at around 400 kilometers per second. That's despite the accelerated expansion of the universe over cosmic timescales. The Virgo supercluster is now thought to be a lobe of an even larger galaxy supercluster known as Laniakea, the center of which is simply referred to by astronomers as the Great Attractor. Despite the Virgo cluster size, it's so far away, it's actually really difficult to see without a reasonably decent backyard telescope, at least 100 millimetres in diameter or larger. 
Visible overhead this time of year is the constellation Corvus the Crow. Greek mythology tells us that Corvus could talk to humans, but he was a lazy bird, and so Apollo took away his ability to speak and banished him to the heavens. One of the highlights in the constellations Virgo and Corvus is the spectacular Sombrero Galaxy, M104. Visible with a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope, this stunning spiral galaxy is seen almost edge on, providing a spectacular backlit view of the galactic bold stars and the molecular gas and dust lanes in its arms. M104 is located some 31 million light years away, and it's moving away from the Milky Way at about 1,000 kilometres per second. A light year is about 10 trillion kilometres, the distance a photon can travel in a year at the speed of light, which is about 300,000 kilometres per second in a vacuum and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. The Sombrero Galaxy has a diameter of about 50,000 light years, making it about a third the size of the Milky Way. It's surrounded by up to 2,000 globular clusters and an active central supermassive black hole at least a billion times the mass of our Sun. By comparison, Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy, is just 4.3 million times the mass of the Sun. Globular clusters are tight balls comprising millions of stars, which were originally all formed at the same time out of the same collapsing molecular gas and dust cloud. The brightest star in Virgo is Spica. It's a spectroscopic binary made up of two stars which are orbiting each other so closely you need a spectroscope to tell them apart. Spiker is located about 250 light years away. Now, looking about 20 degrees above the western horizon early in the evening, you'll find the fourth brightest celestial object in the sky, the dog star Sirius. Only the Sun, the Moon and the planet Venus look brighter. Sirius is actually a binary or double star system. It's located relatively nearby, just 8.6 light years away, in the constellation Canis Major, the greater dog. The primary star, Sirius A, is a hot spectral type A white star with at least twice the mass and size of the Sun and about 25 times more luminous. It's orbited by a faint white dwarf star, Sirius B. A white dwarf is the stellar corpse of a Sun-like star. Having used up its nuclear fuel supply, fusing hydrogen into helium in its core, it then expanded into a red giant, fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. However, some like stars aren't massive enough to fuse carbon and oxygen into heavier elements, and so they turn off. Their outer gaseous envelopes float off into space as spectacular objects known as planetary nebula. What's left behind is a super-dense white-hot stellar core about the size of the Earth, a white dwarf, which will slowly cool down over the eons of time. To the northwest, or right of Sirius, is another fairly bright star called Procyon, It's the brightest star in the constellation Canis Minor, the Lesser Dog. In Greek mythology, Canis Major and Canis Minor were Orion's hunting dogs. Procyon is also a binary star system. It consists of a spectral type F main sequence white-yellow star, Procyon A, and a faint white dwarf companion, Procyon B. Main sequence stars are those undergoing hydrogen fusion in their cores into helium. The white dwarf Procyon b has a little more than half the mass of the Sun and a diameter of about 8,600 kilometres. Located 11.6 light years away, Procyon a is about one and a half times the mass of the Sun and about twice the Sun's radius. It's also much brighter with about seven times the Sun's luminosity, making it unusually bright for a star of this type. And that suggests that it's probably starting to evolve off the main sequence, having fused nearly all of its core hydrogen into helium. It's starting to expand out into a subgiant as it begins fusing core helium and burning hydrogen further out from the core. As it continues to expand, the star will eventually swirl up to somewhere between 80 and 150 times its current diameter, in the process becoming a red or orange giant. This will probably happen sometime within the next 10 to 100 million years. The two stars, Procyon A and B, orbit each other every 40.82 Earth years, at an average distance of 15 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. That means Procyon A and B orbit each other at about the same distance as Uranus's orbit around the Sun. Another easy-to-spot star this time of year is Arcturus, located just 36.7 light-years away. 
It's a bloated, aging red giant, about 7.1 billion years old and now reaching the end of its life. Having used up all its core hydrogen, it's now in the process of fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. And this has caused the star, which is only slightly more massive than the Sun, to expand out to around 25 times the Sun's diameter, becoming 170 times as luminous. It'll soon puff off its outer gaseous envelope as a planetary nebula, revealing its white-hot stellar core and becoming a white dwarf. In Greek mythology, Arcturus was the guardian of the bear. Now, this is a reference to it being next to the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the greater and lesser bears. There's some indications that Arcturus could have a binary stellar companion, but that still remains inconclusive. There's also speculation that it could have a large planet or possibly a substellar object about 12 Jupiter masses orbiting it. Now that puts it awfully close in size to what's considered a brown dwarf. But again, the research remains inconclusive. Looking now to the southeast, you'll see the constellation Sagittarius, the Archer. The Archer marks the direction of the center of our Milky Way galaxy. The galactic center is located some 26,000 light years away, and as we mentioned earlier, it's home to our galaxy's central supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. To the ancient Babylonians, Sagittarius was the god Nurgle, a centaur, a creature that was half man and half horse. The center of the Milky Way and its supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, lies in the westernmost part of Sagittarius. The brightest star in Sagittarius is Epsilon Sagittarii, or Cors Australis, the southern part of the bow. Epsilon Sagittarii is a binary star system located 143 light years away. The primary star is an evolved spectral type B blue giant, nearing the end of its life on the main sequence. It has about three and a half times the sun's mass and about seven times its radius, and it's radiating with around 363 times the sun's luminosity. It's also a very strong X-ray source, and it's spinning very rapidly with an estimated radial velocity of some 236 kilometers per second. The system also displays an excess of infrared radiation emissions, suggesting the presence of a circumstellar disk of dust. The second star in the system appears to be inside this debris disk. Astronomers think it's a spectral type G yellow dwarf star with about 95% the mass of the Sun. Sigma Sagittarii, or Nunci, is the constellation's second brightest star. The name Nunci is Babylonian, but its meaning is unknown. It's thought to represent the ancient Babylonian sacred city of Eridu on the Euphrates River. If correct, it would make Nunci probably the oldest known stellar name in use. It's a spectrotype E blue star located some 260 light years from Earth. It has about eight times the sun's mass, about four and a half times its radius, and about 3,300 times its luminosity. The Sagittarius constellation also hosts many star clusters and nebulae, including some of the best-known astronomical objects in the sky. These include Messier 8, the Lagoon Nebula, a spectacular pink emissions nebula located 5,000 light years from Earth, which measures some 140 light years by 60 light years across. Another easily identifiable object is Messier 17, better known as the Horsehead Nebula. It's located some 4,890 light years away and is a dense region of ionized atomic hydrogen. It spans some 15 light years in diameter and has some 800 times the mass of our Sun. The month of June also marks the first of two annual encounters with the Torrid's meteor shower. The torrids are generated as Earth passes through the debris stream created by the comet 2P Enki, which itself could be a piece of a larger comet which broke apart around 20,000 to 30,000 years ago, probably following numerous interactions with a powerful gravitational field of Jupiter. As their name suggests, the torrid's radiant or apparent point of origin is in the constellation Taurus the Bull. Unlike most meteor showers, the torrids is made up of larger, more massive material, pebbles instead of dust grains. Earth passes through this stream twice a year in June and again in October, which are known as the Halloween fireballs. The torrids release their material both by normal cometary activity and occasionally by close encounters with the tidal force of the Earth and other planets. This makes the torrid stream of material the largest in the inner solar system. And since the meteor stream is rather spread out in space, the Earth takes several weeks to pass through it, causing an extended period of meteor activity compared to the much smaller periods of activity for other meteor showers. Now, importantly included in the stream is a denser flow of gravelly meteoroids called the Torrid Swarm, thought to be a ribbon of rocks roughly 75 million kilometres by 150 million kilometres across. 
Now, occasionally, Earth passes through the larger meteoroids in the denser torrid swarm. In fact, one of the larger chunks of the torrid swarm is now thought to have been the cause of the infamous Tunguska event in the skies over Siberia on June 30, 1908. The Tunguska event is thought to have been the airburst of a 100-metre-wide meteor over the Tunguska region of Russia, causing mass devastation and flattening over 2,000 square kilometres of forest into matchsticks. In fact, the blast was bright enough to light up the skies in London a third of the way around the planet, with reports of Londoners being able to read the evening newspaper without any artificial lighting. Tunguska remains the largest known Earth impact event in recorded history. Joining us now is Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, to take us through the rest of our tour of the June night skies. This evening begins in June. We have our galaxy, the Milky Way, seen from the inside stretching across the sky from the east to the west. The Southern Cross is sort of inside the Milky Way and you can see that down in the south, about two-thirds of the way up from the horizon, between the horizon and overhead. Standing upright, it looks a bit like a kite. Over in the west, after sunset, you'll see the brightest star in the night sky, that's called Sirius. And if you go around to its left, so you're going southwest, you'll see another bright star, that's called Canopus in the constellation Carina. Canopus is the second brightest star in the night sky. Now further around, again, sort of looking more directly south, if you're in a dark location with clear skies and you have an unobstructed horizon, so you don't have uh, buildings and trees or hills and things in the way, see if you can spot the two Magellanic Cloud galaxies, right? These are the two closest uh, sizable galaxies to our own Milky Way. They're sort of oddball galaxies. They're not a nice, beautiful spiral shape or an elliptical shape or whatever. They're sort of strange dwarf sort of shape. And they're very hard to see. Uh, They just look like smudges or clouds. That's why they're called the Magellanic Clouds, because Magellan named them. But uh, they are actual galaxies, but you do need a dark sky to see them, okay? Uh, And the, the large Magellanic Cloud is quite large. Um, you think, well, what's a cloud? Why isn't it moving? But that's actually a galaxy. So it's pretty amazing if you do let your eyes become dark adapted and you have a look and and you can spot it. Both are thought to be irregular spirals and they may have been disrupted by the Milky Way. In fact, they're orbiting the Milky Way, which is why they're considered satellite galaxies. And uh, this could be their first time they've they've come into orbit around our galaxy, but uh, our galaxy's already spotted them and it's stealing stars and gas and dust from them. In fact, there's now a stellar bridge running from the small to the large Magellanic Cloud and from there, it's being gobbled up by the Milky Way. Really cool if you can get to see them. And of course, way back in 1987, uh, there was a supernova that went off in the large Magellanic Cloud. And I, I still remember seeing that. Uh, mm, it's faded yes. from view now, so you, you, you can't see it now. It's, it's, it's all faded and gone away. That's quite a long time ago now. It's, what, 32 years? Um, I was working at 8DN in Darwin at the time. Darwin, well, you would, could, you probably wouldn't have been able to see the Magellanic. Oh, uh, not just. really from where I was, no. Yeah, well, I, I certainly remember seeing it from Sydney. and Yeah, the nearest large supernova explosion of modern times. Yeah, well, astronomers had been waiting for basically 400 years, roughly, mm. for one of these things to happen, and because uh, the last one was pre-telescope, pre-Galileo, and uh, we'd spotted, or say we, scientists had spotted lots and lots of supernovae in other galaxies galaxies you know they're so far away and so faint that you need big telescopes uh, even big backyard telescopes to see them but one that was bright enough to be able to be seen with the naked eye it hadn't been seen for centuries so when it happened everyone just all the scientists just dropped what they were doing all the all the telescopes that could see it basically stopped whatever observing programs they had at least for a while parts of the night at least and and just trained every instrument they could on this supernova and because they knew that it might be another 400 years before they got the chance again. The northern half of the sky, this time of year, for people down here in the southern hemisphere, it actually seems quite bare. A lot of the, the bright constellations and bright stars and things have, have disappeared from view. There is a, a bright star up there in the northern part of the sky that we can see about halfway up from the horizon. That's called Arcturus. There's another one uh, that's more or less overhead at the moment called Spica. They're interesting to see. And as the night goes on, as the Earth turns, things will change in the sky. So we said before that as the evening begins and the sun's gone down, it's nice and dark, that the Milky Way is stretching from east to west across the sky. Well, after midnight, and now the Milky Way is sort of stretching from north to south. And up in the so western part of the sky, Sirius, that bright star that we spoke about before, that's gone, that's set in the west. The other bright stars, Vega and Altair, have appeared in the north. And down south, there's another one called Akronar in the southeast. That's another big, bright white star that's coming up. So uh, it's interesting to watch the night sky as the Earth turns on its axis. Now, as far as planets go, just after sunset, have a look to the east, and you'll see a big, bright star coming up over the horizon. Well, in fact, it's not a star. It's the planet Jupiter. Now, this is a really good time to see Jupiter at the moment because the planet's going to reach what's called opposition. It's about where it is in the sky, namely 
on the opposite side of the sky from the sun as seen from Earth. So here on Earth, we've got the sun in one direction and we've got Jupiter 180 degrees in the other direction. The practical upshot of that is that as the sun sets in the west, the planet rises in the east. And the practical, practical upshot of that is that if it, as it's rising in the east at sunset, that means it's going to be uh, visible all night. So it will slowly get higher as the night goes on, and then eventually as morning comes, it will be getting down low in the west. And as the sun starts to come up in the east in the morning, Jupiter will be setting in the west. So you've got basically 12 hours to see Jupiter. Now, following Jupiter up over the horizon about two hours later is Saturn. It's coming up to opposition uh, soon as well. Um, it's fairly bright too, although not as bright as Jupiter, and it has a sort of slightly yellowish sort of tint, whereas Jupiter's quite whitish, bright whitish. Now, in the morning sky, for an early riser, you'll be able to see Venus in the eastern sky from about 5.30 a.m. onwards through until sunrise, of course. Venus, big and bright and amazing. You can't miss it. Everyone says, what on earth is that star out there? I didn't see that there yesterday. Well, that's Venus, the second planet from the sun, and it's, it's big and bright because it's not that far from us and it reflects a lot of light because it's got these lovely white clouds that uh, reflect a lot of the sunlight. Now I haven't mentioned Mercury or Mars just yet, that's because they're both they're roughly both in too close to the same direction as the sun at the moment so they can only be seen in the sort of sunset glow. But you can have a try Mercury looks like a little tiny bright star and Mars is tiny and bright but more of an orangey colour so as the sun has set, have a look to the west, make sure the sun has set, a look to the west and you might be able to see these uh, two little, uh, they look like stars close to the horizon in the twilight glow. It'll be a bit hard though. On June the 18th, they're going to be right next to each other. I mean right next to each other, very, very close, but low down on the horizon and within the evening twilight glow. So you might have trouble seeing them, particularly if you have trees or buildings in the way. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 